So I'm going to be talking about the free will par paradox. Uh, but I'd like to start by just mentioning that uh, how I even got into this game, uh, because I got into it uh, when I was uh, in second grade. Um, I was a very stupid second grader. I knew it, I was, and my teacher told my mother, well, you know, he may be able to get through high school, but he'll never get into college. And uh, it bothered my mother. But it didn't bother me as much as I would like to know what I could do to be smarter. And I came home and I asked my dad, uh, how do you get stuff into your head? I can't seem to keep anything in my head. And uh, he said, you just do. Well, you know, that didn't help. You know, nowadays I would suggest you tell the kid, well, you know, try writing it down. Try looking over your notes. There are ways that you might be able to get stuff into your head, but uh, I wasn't, you just do. Um, and I kept bugging him, and at some point he said to me, you know, if you understood how the brain works, you could be smart. <laughs> and I thought, what a wonderful idea. That is wonderful. And I determined uh, to try to find out. I, re um, I remember later in the fourth grade, um, walking in this garden, trying to think about what's in my head, trying to introspect. And you know, it did not help at all. As far as I could tell, inside my head was a homunculus of some sort looking out through, through my eyes. And all I have to do is understand the brain of the homunculus. And I understood that, that you know, this is not going to work. And I just couldn't figure out what would work. Uh, I did actually eventually get into MIT. Uh, I took a course with Richard Schoenwald. We read the 20 volumes of uh, Freud uh, very fast. And um, at some point after, after this year's course, he stopped me in the, the halls and said, you know, we have a wonderful person that has come to MIT named Warren S. McCulloch. Dr. Warren S. McCulloch. Uh, you should go and intro uh, introduce, he said something else. He said, uh, as you know, Freud wrote a paper called the, pa the Future of an Illusion. McCulloch wrote a paper called The Past of a Delusion. And he was referring to psychoanalysis. And uh, so Sean Wall told me to go and introduce myself. I did. I went there. I said, I want to work in your lab. Uh, he said, uh, you see all these books? Uh, after you read them, come back. And of course, I wasn't going to do that. But I did read some of, some of McCulloch's stuff, and I was able to prove a couple theorems, and then he took me in. So that was nice. I, McCulloch was wonderful. So McCulloch, you know McCulloch uh, from McCulloch and Pitts. They're the ones that define the, the formal neuron, first form, definition of the formal neuron. and. Um, and uh, prove that you can build a Turing machine uh, from these formal neurons. So uh, this, this, this was wonderful. This guy was wonderful, McCulloch. I love him. He was so supportive. Everything I wanted to do, he was very positive, except for one thing. When uh, a few months after I started working there, I told him, what I really want to do is I want to work on consciousness. And he looked at me, and for the first time in my life, he said, you will not work on consciousness. That was 1958. Why? Well, uh, I knew why. Uh, Walter Pitts came over and uh, explained, you know, well, we have this much skull, and the EEG can't get through. You can't, do any, you can't find out what's going on inside. You can't can't do that. To, what he didn't under, what they didn't understand, and is that I really didn't want to go into that those details. I didn't want the circuit diagram of the brain. I wanted something that I could understand how we get consciousness, how we are able to think. I wanted something at a very high level. And the wonderful thing for uh, us is that uh, uh, about uh, two, uh, ten fifteen. 10 to 15 years ago, uh, Lenore said to me, you know, you can get back into consciousness now. It's OK. You can get back in. What? Is that after you got the Turing Yeah, yeah, that was nice. Right. 
right, right. You, you, don't, you don't go into consciousness or you lose your job. So <laughs> that was at that time. But Lenore, t uh, Lenore kept, did, we, Lenore knew McCulloch. Lenore and I were married when, 60 years ago, no. 62 years ago, yeah. So, so, and she knew McCulloch, and we were talking about this together, and uh, so that, that was great. And uh, so Lenore said, you can get back into consciousness. And uh, what's wonderful for me, personally, is that this, our model is what I wanted. When I was in the fourth grade, it's the model that I wanted something at a very high level that could give me some understanding of what's going on. Okay, so I'm, that's, uh, uh, that's half of the talk. <laughs> uh, let me continue uh, uh, here. So, uh, uh, so I'm going to talk about free will, and I'm going to, I, uh, you know, free will, big problem, and it's been a big problem for a long time. Uh, the, uh, the important thing is that I did do something that was useful between the time McCulloch told me I can't work on consciousness and until 10 years ago, uh, I, I was teaching courses on theoretical computer science. That, that was how I made a living. And it was great because theoretical computer science actually told us what to, how to understand some of these problems. So that was great. So TCS is theoretical computer science. It's a branch of mathematics that is especially concerned with the importance of taking resources such as time and space and randomness into account for computation and for philosophy. In this talk, we're not going to use any of the big theorems of TCS. We can get into that. Mainly, we're going to use just the fact that computation takes time. And this was always known, of course, but computation time was never viewed as key to solving deep philosophical problems. It never was, and it, such is the problem of free will. And uh, the basic thing that I'm going to suggest is that the reason that the philosophers could not understand the, the free will problem, you know, the, the paradox of free will, is because they didn't take into account that when you have to make a decision, it takes time to figure out which of path you're going to take. And if the decision is instant, there's no time for the free will to show up. Okay. Uh, yeah, the problem of consciousness, such as problems of free will. So we start with free will because it's an old and puzzling problem. It has a lot to do with consciousness. And our, solu our solution shows how theoretical computer science enables one to deal with this particular problem. Uh, so, but first, let's define free will. Okay, so I'm going to get into the definition. I thought maybe it would be fun to ask ChatGP what it thinks free will is. I did. Uh, please, MB is me. Uh, please define free will. Uh, and it tells me free will is the ability to make choices without external coercion. And so then, uh, would you agree, I asked, that free will is the ability of conscious entities to make decisions that violate physics as we know it? Because, as far as I could tell, the physics is on the physics is right, and how can there be free will? That's that's the whole free will problem. And ChatGPT said, "No, I would not. Free will as a philosophical concept pertains to the capacity of conscious beings to make choices that are not entirely determined by external factors or pre-existing conditions. While the relation between free will and the laws of physics is still a subject of debate." debate it is generally seen as compatible with the principles and constraints of the physical world rather than in conflict with them. I like, I must tell you, I really love this chat GPT. <laughs> and then I said, uh, w would you agree that quantum physics as we know it asserts that the current state of the universe determines a probability distribution on future states of the universe and that the exercise of free will cannot affect that probability distribution. And then, oops. And then ChatGPT said, yes, that is an accurate description of the current understanding of quantum physics. 
I like that. It was I was on the right track. I also talked to the physicists. I'm on the right track. Quantum physics suggests that the current state of the universe determines a probability distribution on future states, and the exercise of free will, as commonly understood, is not believed to directly affect or alter that probability distribution. The exercise of free will is typically associated with choices made within the framework of the probabilistic outcomes determined by quantum physics. So I love that, that it's basically, it's agreeing with, you know, I love it because it agrees with me, and, uh, and, and it under, seems to understand, uh, okay, so let's keep on going. So what's the free will paradox? I like, I especially like Samuel Johnson's description of it. I mean, it's very short and succinct. All science is against the freedom of the will. Uh, and uh, all experience is for it. All science is against it because Samuel Johnson was 18 years old when Newton died. He already knew that from Newton, everything, the world is deterministic. Believe the world to be deterministic. And so uh, all science is against the freedom of the will. And then, but all experience is for it. That's the puzzler, right? How, how can you have both? The problem is over a thousand years old, uh, over two thousand years old, Lucretius before, uh, in BC uh, had this wonderful statement, if all movement is always interconnected, the new arising from the old in a determinate order, that, that you know, bam, 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 you in a determinate order, if the atoms never swerve so as to uh, so, as, so as to originate some new movement that will snap the bonds of fate, the everlasting cause sequence of cause and effect. What is the source of the free will possessed by living things throughout the earth? Uh, it's kind of long, but wow, this is good. And I remember my the teacher that taught me Freud also told me had me read Lucretius, and this was wonderful. That was when, so this is, I'm a junior in college, that's when I'm learning about the free will problem. Okay, so, so the solution from TCS is just that computation takes time. And uh, um, uh, so, to, so let's look at the paradox on the assumption that we're living in a deterministic world. But in a deterministic world, it's very clear that all science is against the freedom of the will. So that's, that's pretty clear in the deterministic world. Let's see why an entity in a deterministic world would experience, would, feel, would experience a sense of free will, why it would believe it has free will. And so I'm going to take as an example the uh, the deterministic uh, world uh, suggested by Conway's Game of Life. You may know this. It's, uh, these are the rules of the game. Uh, on the left, uh, you see that if the, we're looking at that green cell. If you have zero or one cells alive around you, you die. If you have two cells around you, you survive. Two or three. If you have four cells around you, four or more, you die. This is Conway's game of life. And if, there, if you have exactly three, even if you're not alive, you will come alive at that point. It, uh, what matters is only this is a very determined, it's not a game between two people, it's a, simply a deterministic world. And in this world, in this world, some interesting things happen. This is using those rules, and you can see how information can travel along here. And, uh, the, the, in this world, it is possible to have uh, a, a universal Turing machine. You can build Turing machines. You can build universal Turing machines. You can build Turing machines that self-reproduce. You can build, that's an, we'll call that an entity. You can build collections of entities. You can build cities out of this. You can have a world in this. This is a world not very different from ours. It can be. It's a deterministic world. There is no, it, 
in this world, there is no free will. So I'm agreeing with that first part. There is no free will. Now let's ex explain why, even in this deterministic world, an entity experiences free will. And here's where time comes in. Uh, and I'm going to do this in terms of a, a chess game. So if you play chess, you know that every so often you come to the situation where you have uh, to decide between two possible moves. Should the knight move here or should the bishop move there? And they both look good. You know, the other moves, you can throw them away, but those seem to be the two moves. One of those two is going to be right and the other one will kill you. Which is right? And the god that made up this world, this deterministic world, this completely deterministic world, it knows what that entity who's playing this chess will do. Because for the god, the, the computation is instantaneous. It can move the world forward, see what it will do. How can this entity possibly have free will? But the entity itself is not a god. It does not know what it will do. It can only find out by actually doing some computation. See what happens if you move the knight. See what happens if you move the bishop. Try to figure out which you think will be the best of possible worlds. Even in a quantum world, there is a, a probability distribution of possibilities. You want to kind of narrow it down. You don't want to choose the, 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 uh, the, make the choice that any time a knight ha uh, ha is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is compared to a bishop, the knight should make its move. That would be so silly. No, you want to actually see what's going on. You should take some time to pursue this and see which would be the better move. And there, at that point, that entity which has to decide between the two, during that time that's doing the computing, it knows that it will choose whichever it finds to be in its best interest, whichever move. It, does, it is not a god. It doesn't know what it will do but it knows that it can compute and decide which, which will be in its best interest. And uh, that, for that reason, because during that time it knows it will choose whichever is best for it, uh, uh, it will, uh, where, where are we? God knows, yes. The entity is checking out the possibilities. It knows that it will make whichever move it determines is best in the time available. Da da, uh, da da, uh, and this is experienced as free will. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.